director at Access. We're an international NGO that uh, defends and extends the digital rights of users at risk around the world. Um, I want to start today uh, with a big thank you to our panelists and audience members for being here. Uh, it takes a special kind of person to care about spectrum policy at 9 a.m. on the last day of IGF. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so uh, while, while many of our esteemed panelists have been thinking about spectrum policy for, for a long time, uh, my interest in spectrum really came out of the Arab Spring. Um, I think while the conversations about communications policy in that historic moment uh, tends to be dominated by talk about social media and censorship. Um, I think for the, for me, the post-revolutionary transition has really highlighted the need for, for much broader media uh, and, and communications policy reform and sort of greater thinking about infrastructure uh, in the region and indeed worldwide. Uh, and I think <laughs> the topic of spectrum allocation regulation, um, which determines sort of the frequencies that are assigned to telecoms and broadcasters and other wireless technologies, uh, has remained one of the sort of least po uh, understood policy areas, um, despite the fact that spectrum reform could dramatically improve democratic access to both traditional uh, and new media, as well as being a powerful tool for development. Um, and so, uh, for development and expanding access to communications technologies. And Can you hear me? Okay, is this better? Okay, uh, so <laughs> I'll stop talking in a minute so you don't have to deal with that. But uh, in this panel, I think we will explore a little bit more sort of what spectrum is and how it can be used, hopefully debonkifying it a bit in the process. Um, no? Are we still having feedback? We're, are we demonstrating it? <laughs> Um, is this better if I whisper? I'll, I'll hide them under the table. How's that? Okay. Uh, so hopefully we'll discuss a little bit about how Spectrum can be leveraged for, uh, for development purposes and for democracy, uh, as well as sort of some, explore some of the best practices in, in this policy arena. Um, you guys came here to hear the panel, not me, so maybe we can just quickly, uh, everyone can just sort of say a line or two of just who they are, and then we'll, we'll launch into the panel. Uh, Kate, you want to kick us off? Hi, my name is Kate Coyer. I'm the director of the Center for Media and Communication Studies at Central European University, based in Budapest, Hungary. And just a quick word, I mean, my involvement in issues of spectrum actually goes back to low power FM radio movements and the pirate radio movements and um, the desire for expanding access to the airwaves in a much more traditional radio format through community broadcasting and from there the natural extension into this arena. Thanks. Uh, thank you. My name is Paul Keneally. I'm working with the International Telecommunication Union which is the global body tasked with the coordination and management of, of spectrum allocation and uh, orbital satellite slots. Um, so very much here today to, to contribute to the discussion, uh, to elaborate a little bit more about what ITU's role is specifically, but also to listen and to hear what others are, are saying and suggesting and, uh, and then starting a good conversation around this. I think it's, it's great that we have such a discussion. It's true that it takes a special type of person to get up at 9 a.m. in the morning uh, to, to discuss spectrum, but nevertheless, I think at ITU, th that's a very welcome, um, a very welcome development that there are more uh, interests from civil society and other groups to discuss uh, the whole area of the spectrum because it is, a, I think, probably the most important thing is that it's a finite resource, and that's something uh, that it's a collective responsibility to, to take seriously. Good morning. My name is Moes Chakshuk, I'm from Tunisia. I'm interested about Spectrum is for years because we worked with the regulatory reform and the regulatory agency in Tunisia and we had a lot of uh, challenges actually to do, to, to do a reform in Tunisia because Spectrum is, a very, is an important issue for a democratic country and I think country, uh, government has to think about it in order to, to make things available for innovation and, uh, and so on. I'm Paul Mitchell from Microsoft, and uh, my work in Spectrum goes back to before the U.S. digital television transition when we were trying to figure out what the potential implications for the software industry would be. And that's been more than a decade of experimentation around um, new ways to manage Spectrum and use, that, use it for 
uh, delivering communications and um, and uh, software connectivity. Interesting talk. And I'm Claudia Selli with uh, at and I'm the European Affairs Director and I'm based in Brussels, so I'm much more policy focused rather than on technical issues. Great, thanks all. Um, let's start it off. Paul to my left, as opposed to Paul to my right. Um, what is Spectrum and how has the ITU historically been involved in its management and allocation? Um, well, Spectrum is, as I, as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's a finite resource. I won't go into the scientific uh, explanations of it, not least because I'm not qualified to do so, but basically it's an electromagnetic band that uh, circles the globe where all radio frequencies pass through. And it's, it's, it, again, to repeat, it's, it's a finite resource. <coughs> so th the global body tasked with, with overseeing that and managing that is the ITU. And that's at the, at the core of the ITU's work since its origins in 1865. We've been, we've been working on these issues. <coughs> in the ITU, I think it's important just to understand we have three different components. One is the Radio Communications uh, Bureau, which, which oversees all of these issues linked to spectrum and, and orbital satellite slots, um, et cetera. We also have a standardization body, and the, a lot of the radio communication work feeds into that. So a lot of the standards that exist today in terms of, of uh, ensuring harmonized approach and, and efficient interoperability around the world, which allows our roaming to work here in Azerbaijan, um, et cetera. Th this this is helps to the, to the standards and recommendations that come from the radio communication conferences. The third body in ITU is our development body, and this really is at the, at the heart of, of, of the raison d'etre of the ITU, which is to, to connect everybody and to have the whole world uh, have the ability to access vital communication infrastructures. And that's embedded in our constitution, in Article 33 of our constitution, which we often look to in ITU as, as our own Article 19. Um, so th the work the work is very um, it's a very heavy work. There's a very detailed coordination involved, and it culminates in um, in regular conferences held normally every three to four years. Um, and I've been at many different conferences in my life, but this one really is quite unique. They run for about five weeks. They go 24 hours a day, and you have huge delegations uh, deliberating over frequencies and, and different issues, uh, which... Paul, which what's the name of the conference? The conference is called the World Radio Communication Conference, and the next one is in 2015 in Geneva. And the outcome of these conferences are all compiled in something called the radio regulations, which are available uh, through the ITU Radio Communication Bureau. And they basically govern the, the, the allocation of frequencies around the world. Thanks. Let's, um, let's turn now to, to Moa Shakshuk. Let's look at this from, from a regulator's perspective. Sort of what are um, sort of the best or most innovative uses of spectrum policy for development and democracy? Have you struggled with these issues uh, within the Tunisian context? First of all, you know that Tunisia is very well uh, positioned in the region in terms of uh, indicators, ICT indicators. Infrastructure is very well established in Tunisia, in uh, including uh, fibers, uh, propagate lines, you know, wireless uh, networks. And the penetration is quite higher in telephony, but the issue actually for the government and for all Tunisia is just to promote broadband. So that's how for the spectrum is, but is an important issue because wireless technology is available, especially in, you know, in urban areas, but we need more focus on, uh, on rural areas. If you look to the revolution, if you hit status in regions where there is few broadband penetration, so a small broadband penetration, I think. So here, the government has a lot of challenges to promote broadband in those regions, especially to improve employment, to promote employment, to, 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 to create employment, and, and also to, to make content available for those people. Of course, a lot of them have used broadband to participate in the revolution by posting content, you know, but it's also our mandate today to, 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 to tell to those people that says, okay, you need to have access to the spectrum, to you need to have access to, to broadband, and uh, government is the it is the mandate of the government to promote broadband in those regions. So this is how we our main our, our main focus in this region. Also, there is an issue about media when you deal about broadcasting uh, radios. You know that l uh, re uh, um, how to say media have been controlled for years by the, by the, by the regime before. So actually, opening the r the, the media channels, radios, TV. 
So it's very important also to, to promote very innovative uh, pr policy in order to create more media uh, broad broadcasts so in, in, and lo uh, and why not local radios in, uh, in, in rural areas because it's very important for those people to be connected and to know uh, how to be involved in the, in the economic development in general. Thank you. I just want to follow up on one point there, Moaz. In terms of, sort of Tunisia is known for having a number of, of pirate radio stations. Uh, how has this been influenced by the regulatory environment in Tunisia, and what's changing since the revolution? Uh, it's a quite complicated issue because, um, yeah, it's you know the situation in my country is quite better, but it's also also got a lot of difficulties uh, in terms of political tension. So we don't have really actually. We don't have. Um, uh, it's it, it's impossible to 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 have a, b a huge reform in terms of ICT, for example, because we don't have an, a, a constitution actually. So we need to wait until the constitution will be voted by the assembly, and also we we need to be ready to for consultations. And people are not aware of the importance of this for those reforms. So uh, actually, the policy making and the regulatory are trying to to to, to uh, and, and, and making huge efforts to, to, to promote broadband and to make all those reforms and, and implementing in implementing in Tunisia, but it's quite uh, difficult. Yeah. Let's, we'll come back uh, a little bit later to discuss sort of what those those recommendations are and how, how that, that rollout's being done. But um, let's let's go now to, to Paul Mitchell from Microsoft. You've been a uh, sort of leader in white spaces research. You know, what are white spaces? How can they be utilized? You know, how are they changing um, the game? So white spaces are basically the parts of a block of spectrum that are allocated but not used. So one way to think about it is if you look at a parking lot and there's a bunch of cars in some of the parking spaces and there's some parking spaces that are empty, those empty spaces in the, the equivalent in the spectrum bands are the white spaces. And the idea is that you can opportunistically take advantage of that spectrum to do a, you know, to do a, a lot of different things. One, one of the unique challenges of spectrum management, I think, is evolving our system from what, what it was in 1912 after the Titanic sank. And the goal was to try to find a way to make sure that all the ships could hear each other and that there would be sort of some common common understanding of what was happening on what frequency. That gave us the allocation system we have today, which has been quite miraculous. So the ITU deserves a lot of credit for managing what has been a fairly complicated thing. Because of that, we have all of the, the wonderful wireless things we have today. At the same time, that technology, which was state of the art 100 years ago based on what we thought we knew about spectrum isn't really um, state of the art today. In fact, while Paul on my left says that spectrum is a finite resource, I would argue it exactly the opposite, which is that spectrum is an infinite resource. And the reason that spectrum is an infinite resource is because it is one of the few things that in which the nanosecond you've used a particular bit of that electromagnetic spectrum, it is immediately regenerated and recreated. So the challenge is, in fact, not to um, to manage this on the basis of keeping large pieces of l large separations between users, but figuring out how users can cooperatively use the same resource at the same time. Now, in this particular venue, we don't see that working very well. We have Wi-Fi, we've had Wi-Fi problems here all week. This is exactly how not to manage spectrum. So that's that's a good demonstration. But in a properly managed network environment, we are continually reusing effectively the same spectrum. We can have multiple things running on the same channels that aren't really conflicting with each other. And the challenge is all in how you actually manage that technically. So bringing it back to white spaces, white spaces is one way to manage that resource in, in and, and get more out of the spectrum than we had before. Because instead of it sitting empty doing nothing between two channels, if you can use that channel without interfering with the channels next to it, 
then you've immediately expanded your capacity. And in that, you can deliver broadband services, you could do other traditional types of, of broadcasting at lower power, you can use it for paging services, um, you can use it for specialized, broad specialized transmission services like medical telemetry or health life safety telemetry or sensor networks uh, controlling traffic signals. Um, in Europe, there are some great, great uh, experiments going on how you can create things like automobile, autom car chains or car trains where the cars connect to each other and can travel, you know, three inches apart from each other because they're instantly in communication with each other, um, which improves efficiency on the freeways if that could happen. So all of those things are possible um, with the right kind of evolution in policy, which is which needs to reflect the balance of all of the services that that are required, if, and especially the ones that are important for life safety, like safe aircraft navigation and safe marine navigation, and for you know person-to-person -person communications, like you know voice telephony, all very important to make sure that the technology um, keeps those things going accurately. But I think we're at this interesting pivotal moment now where the technology that w the things we know how to do technically have dramatically outpaced what our current allocation system is and it's going to it will create some great opportunities for discussion at the next WRC in 2015 and beyond thanks Paul <coughs> so we have uh, Paul Keneally on the left saying that spectrum is finite and Paul on the right saying that maybe Spectrum is a infinitely renewable resource. Is that is that a fair characterization? Uh, Claudia, what do you think? Is is <laughs> and and is Spectrum actually scarce as we often hear? Well, first of all, um, I would say that certainly nowadays we are confronted with a Spectrum scarcity. At least for um, I mean, uh, as AT and T is experiencing it, the the consumer is really driving. You know the. Uh, internet and wireless revolution today. Uh, today there are more uh, wireless subscription than, than people basically and, and the demand is coming also because users use more and more these smart tablets and, and smartphone and basically the, um, the smartphone use 30 uh, times more data than, uh, than the cell phone that they are replacing so certainly there is more and more demand um, and, and, and also uh, certainly there is more and more need for spectrum. Um, and so that we're really confronted with a, with a crunch. At the same time, let's say that we can use spectrum in an efficient way uh, um, through technology. And uh, at and also has been investing uh, quite a lot in uh, to upgrade the network, to uh, uh, acquire also the spectrum. And uh, in the last past five years, we have been investing $115 billion uh, to upgrade the network, to enhance the network, and certainly um, at the same time, uh, we, uh, which is basically in the next three years, we will be also investing 14 uh, billion dollars. Um, and so also, but uh, to, to, um, I have seen that the IT already in 2006 has recognized that there, there would have been a spectrum crunch. And then in fact, that in, um, by 2015, um, global, uh, let's say more developed countries would have needed uh, probably the allocation of uh, um, roughly one, uh, 1,300 uh, megahertz, and by 2020, uh, 1,720 megahertz. And also, um, what I wanted to point it out is that there are a lot of studies, such as Cisco, which has really foreseen that the, the, the demand in, uh, of data will continue to grow. And certainly by 2016 also, we will have, you know, this demand will exceed 50%. So uh, let's say that certainly spectrum can be used in an efficient way through technology, but we are confronted, I mean, in the, in, the, in, the, in the next coming years, we are certainly confronted with a, a spectrum crunch. So you're, you're talking, uh, sort of mentioned sort of efficient technologies or more efficient use of technologies in a more nuts and bolts, rec, you know, level, more concrete level. What are, how, how is AT&T and sort of the other telecoms coping with this? Let's dial down a little bit more in terms of what are the actual policies or technologies that are being used if, as you say, there was this sort of uh, looming spectrum crunch. 
Yeah, certainly, um, you know, networks are becoming more and more intelligent. So um, the certainly we, we can deploy and we can use the spectrum in a more efficient way. Um, at the same time, um, let's say that we, we really um, ask normally also for government from a policy. I mean, you, you need also uh, some policy action, as it was said before also by other panelists, in the sense that we certainly ask government to release more and more spectrum and also to say to, to take some action and from a policy uh, point of view it, it certainly is uh, is important to have a spectrum harmonization as it was said also before first of all because it can reduce costs um, of devices uh, of also broadband deployment uh, and and certainly it can create also more uh, um, a scale of economy and, uh, and, uh, and, um, and, and so this is certainly important also because it would avoid interferences because spectrum has no border. And, um, and so it is important that to countries which are next to each other, you know, um, eventually adopt similar, uh, similar uh, band and, and then, yeah. All right, let's turn to you, Kate. Um, Claudia is suggesting that regulators should release more spectrum. What do you think? And uh, to, to, to the telecoms, presumably. <laughs> and then, uh, and, and sort of stepping back from the telecoms environment more back into sort of broadcasters, another uh, large user of spectrum. Um, how is a country's media environment affected by its spectrum policy? Well, I, um, thanks for those questions. I think that the danger of the um, framework of, the, of thinking about the sc spectrum as a scarce resource and the whole scarcity paradigm is that we see the replication of the traditional broadcast framework being applied to an environment where there is, I don't know if it's infinite, but certainly I, scarcity is not the problem. I think the problem is a regime that focuses on property rights and sees spectrum as something that can be bought and sold rather than, rather than something that needs to be um, a space for encouraging media pluralism and diversity. And I think to me that's the most central um, challenge. It's not the challenge is not how do you manage spectrum technically. I think the the the, the, the challenge is how do you um, rethink spectrum so that um, it is uh, encouraging pluralism and diversity in the media e ecosystem. And I think for that to happen, what you need first and foremost is you need government will. I mean, you need governments that are willing to have an enabling environment and want to have more voices participating in the um, in the media ecosystem. I mean, you also need very practical things like a reg the independence of a regulatory authority, functioning judiciary, press laws, and press freedoms. Um, but really, there there is that role for um, for government in, in terms of uh, making that space something that isn't dominated by. Um, the large corporate interests, that it is something that has, uh, the spectrum is a place where there's, you know, adequate um, uh, provisions for commercial interests, for public service broadcasting, and for, um, for community and non-profit, non-commercial usage. And, you know, to put it back into this, this framework around Article 19, I mean, if we're interested in ensuring communicative rights and the right to free expression and, and to receive and impart information, then this has to extend across layers of infrastructure and it's not just about content and it's certainly not just about the technical um, questions uh, and so I think that you know spectrum matters very much um, to the to the media ecosystem and we have to look at it uh, you know um, across the different platforms thanks Kate um, maybe we'll give Mo as a chance to, to respond to jump in there First of all, I fully with Kate about the necessary. The ne it, it is important to have a regulatory body that is an independent and it is uh, that is focused on general interests about not just about m how how to get money from the spectrum. It's also about how the community can be involved to create to content and how the community can create to innovate. So uh, this is a challenge for us because you know before the revolution we had a, a regulatory system that is very complicated. It's much. Maybe maybe considered one of the most complicated regulatory system because we have uh, a national authority for uh, national authority for, com for for regulatory authority for IMT, Instance Nationale de Telecommunication in French, and uh, there's an, uh, an agency which is managing supposed to be managing the the, uh, the, the spectrum, and this agency is 
under the control of the ministry, and the regulator is independent, supposed to be independent, but uh, it can't the law. So, but uh, and if you look, you can have also other agencies or, or, or governmental structures that are under the control of the ministry that is uh, involved by somehow with the regulatory reform and the regulatory structure. So uh, I think it's very important for the government for to, to, to make a policy to restructure all this, all, 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 all this phase, as you can say. And uh, because uh, if we need, there's a lot of conflict between those agencies first, and this conflict is used to be a way to control the system before, but now I think in a new Tunisia, in a democratic country, I think it's very important for us to have a strong and enforced uh, regulatory body and and let the government just make the policy for, for those issues. So it's, I think it's very important what you mentioned, Kate, and I agree with that. Yeah. Great. In the uh, spirit of IGF, maybe we can bring in some uh, audience participation. Do we have any remote participants? No. So are there <laughs> it takes a really special kind of person to want to remotely participate in a panel on spectrum policy. Uh, go ahead, Carlos. Okay, great. Um, good morning to everybody. My name is uh, Carlos Cortez. I work as a researcher for the University of Palermo Center on Freedom of Expression. Um, a couple of days ago, on day one, there was another panel on spectrum, uh, but it was more related to mobile technologies, and I made the same question I want to to, um, to tell you, and it's about the, the open spectrum or the cognitive technologies that would allow a total different uh, framework to allocate spectrum. So you were talking about um, the the proprietary model, which I think also relates to the to the scarcity debate. Um, so I asked them if the open spectrum or a total shift in this framework was something that we could really start looking at down the road. And most of the people in that panel said that this was something that it was not really coming anytime soon. So um, I wanted to know the uh, the opinion of perhaps all of you are the ones who would like to, to think about this, if this is really a policy option down the road in any country or in some region, because at least in theory it looks quite quite interesting. Thank you. So I would, I, I would say the current system is 100 years old, approximately, and, and as long as you don't expect something to happen dramatically in the next 18 months or so, I think it, it will happen. And it's just happening, you know, uh, one slow step at a time. There's a lot of challenge in changing over all of the ecosystem that we've built. Just, just the process of changing from just a very small uh, splotch of spectrum from analog television broadcasting to digital television broadcasting took in the, U in the United States well over a decade to sort that out. And that's just one country, one small piece. Um, at the same time, the technology to do dynamic allocation exists and it's getting better. And I think what you're going to see is things like, you know, countries gradually adopting policies on sharing first, allocation second, and, and back into it that way. So the United States is sort of going down that path. The recent report from the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology made several recommendations, some of which the, the White House has indicated that they will adopt, um, which is basically the, the primary recommendation was that as a policy matter, the government would adopt sharing first uh, when it comes to all federal spectrum. In the United States, we have spectrum divided between federal, which is, is uh, government-used spectrum, and effectively civilian, which is the stuff the FCC manages. And there are bands which are sh even which are even shared between federal users and non-federal users. In the case of the PCAST report, the idea was start with the federal, which is the thing that the, that the government has the greatest control over uh, sharing on its own. But you're going to see that, that happen. TV white spaces is a really simple way to get into sharing. Um, just a couple of, of data points. Uh, we operate some spectrum observatories, which are basically uh, devices that sniff 
the spectrum and see how much of it's actually used. So in the Seattle area, Seattle's a large metropolitan area. It's the 13th largest uh, uh, demographic manage uh, management area in the United States. And 80% um, of the spectrum approximately is vacant approximately 80% of the time across uh, all of the, the space from 30 uh, hertz to 6 gigahertz. Um, we offer, have another one in Washington, D.C., and the numbers are very, uh, very similar. And we expect that basically with the, the allocation patterns that we have today, that is what we will actually see in most places. In some places, it will be a lot more. For example, marine allocations in the state of Nebraska are not really used at all, right? And, and that's part of the wonder of the system that we have. It's great because you get all these harmonization uh, across countries, and then you have things like marine bands in, in Nebraska. Um, so the, a couple of other things. I mean, Claudia is right. The demand for data growth is, is phenomenal. And yet today, uh, on a global basis, approximately 70% of all data traffic is carried on Wi-Fi networks. It's 69% uh, for tablets and smartphones. It's about 57% for PCs, generally, depending on where you go. And the Wi-Fi number is going up and the, uh, as a relative percentage versus the cellular, uh, the, the cellular number. And one of the reasons that you can do that is because there's greater reuse of the spectrum between, um, be you know, between backhaul points uh, through Wi-Fi. And Wi-Fi is a great example of a shared technology. Zigbee is another example of a shared technology where devices, the point of the engineering and the devices and the radio systems itself is to be aware of the others in the room effectively and to moderate themselves to get just what they need to accomplish the, the purpose. So I'll stop there. I want to I wanna give Paul to my left uh, an opportunity to respond, but very quickly, Claudia, do you have a response to, to Paul on my right's comments? <laughs> no, I think he, uh, I mean, he gave a... Uh, a, a comprehensive overview of, uh, of the situation, and uh, I agree with what he has uh, been saying. So, so if all of this traffic is going over over Wi-Fi as opposed to cellular data, I, again, I, I, it returns to the question: it, Is there actually a spectrum crunch, and, and are you? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was saying before, precisely. That I mean, everything is becoming mobile. If you think. I don't know, I'm thinking also about the new uh, generation of people that have hardly known a fixed network. You know, uh, if you think about what we can do really with the, the smart tablets, you know, c you can walk around the street and consult uh, on a line map while, you know, being uh, not really, uh, uh, or you, you can even adjust the, uh, I don't know, the thermostat at home while being in a lounge hotel, it's incredible. But that uh, certainly drag more and more demand and, and, and certainly more and more spectrum. That's why, so I return to my point <laughs> where I ask for more and more spectrum. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, Paul, to my left, do you want to take a stab at responding to Carlos's question? Yeah, um, well, the question as well, but also if I can I also, also uh, Paul. touch on a couple yeah. of, of, of comments. Um, first of all, just d to, to make an important distinction that the role of, of the ITU is, is global coordination and management. The, the national uh, allocation policies are purely down to the independent regulators and we, we wouldn't and we shouldn't have any influence on that. Having said that, we do uh, have what I believe is the only uh, symposium for independent regulators where we meet once a year. And these issues of, of white spaces and the challenges of, of spectrum allocation, etc. it was just the most recent one was just held in, in Sri Lanka and th that was very much on the agenda. And there's some very good discussion papers online if anybody wants to look them up. Um, and just also, an, an l l again, it's a national issue, um, but the radio regulations already cover and, pr and have provisions for spectrum sharing. Um, these do not need to be you know, rediscussed. Re it's not a new issue, and this is something that, uh, th that can only be uh, achieved at, at the national level. Um, in terms of, you know, how things have been done uh, the same way for the last hundred years or whatever, um, quite possibly in terms of you know the process of, of, of governments getting around uh, uh, conference tables and, and hammering out uh, agreements around the different gigahertz or, or allocations of spectrum or orbital slots or whatever, quite possibly that's the case. But in terms of looking at new and innovative ways to use spectrum, 
just two days ago, for instance, and as Paul, Paul mentioned uh, this, this auto train in, in Europe, just two days ago we allocated, uh, or we had a workshop on the allocation of the 78 gigahertz band for, um, for auto radar. And this will be, th this will be finalized at the 2015 World Radio Communication Conference. And assuming that it, it all goes well, y you will have an enormous uh, development in, in the intelligent transport systems um, and quite possibly a, an extremely significant reduction in road, road transport uh, accidents um, with, with, with cars literally communicating with, with each other and all of that data being available. So that, that's, you know, th these innovations are happening. Just two more points. Um, on spectrum crunch, I'm no expert about what the situation is in the US uh, or, or, or in Europe. Uh, specifically, I, I do go to New York a lot, and my mobile phone is continuously cutting out of me. I don't know if that's to do with uh, lack of spectrum or lack of investment in the infrastructure, but they're not, you know, they're, they're not the same discussion. Um, and also, um, uh, in terms in, ter in terms of, of what was being said about uh, sp spectrum and media and democracy, I think that's that's an issue that's extremely important. Uh, it is true that the way uh, the way spectrum is debated today in ITU and in, in forums like ITU, it is looked at very much as a technical issue, linked obviously to certain business requirements and, and certain um, services that are needed. Uh, again, linked to global interoperability. Um, but I think that's a really important issue, and I think you know, and, and ITU would be really, really interested to, to, to contribute to that and to even provide a forum to discuss that. Um, and then finally, you know, we're talking a lot about consumer um, consumer use of spectrum, but again, taking the global view in, in ITU, conservation of spectrum has always been important. Why? You know, if it hadn't been, if, if in the 60s or the 70s we had agreed to, to distributing spectrum, allocating spectrum right across the board, three or four or five countries would be using most of the spectrum today. And all of those countries who who didn't even foresee that they would be able to bridge the digital divide would have been left genuinely with a spectrum crunch. So thanks to that sort of deliberative process, uh, many, many countries today are going to realize the vision that Moaz was talking about, which is a global broadband rollout with, I would hope, almost complete connectivity, maybe by as, as soon as 2020. And that's something we're driving in ITU through the Broadband Commission. I just, um really quickly wanted to make a point about this question of allocation and again I don't want to be the one beating beating a certain dead horse that Please it's do. not uh, I will beat um, that it, it's not just about technical allocation and, I, and I, I get very nervous whenever and I know that you know there's been very important um, caveats made in, in, in even so far in this discussion but that it's not just about the technical fixes and the technical allocation, but how those allocations are being made and the danger of, um, of auctions in the way that they've been um, done and, and carried out so far that absolutely um, you know, benefit and are in the interest of the largest players in the, in the space of, um, of, sp of spectrum. Um, and, you don't, and if you don't have set-asides or some provisions that assure and allow for significant non-commercial usage and for smaller companies to, to have access. Again, you're just closing the door. You have this, this technical possibility to create a space for new entrants to the marketplace, to rethink both the efficiency and, again, the, the usage in the, the media and democracy framework of who gets access. to. It's a good old-fashioned who has access to the airwaves question. Um, and so how those allocations are made beyond the technical capacities um, are, is so, so critical. Thanks. Really quickly, because I wanted to throw it back to the floor. Uh, I just want to raise something regarding uh, at spectrum allocation. For sure, it's an you know, important issue because in my country, for example, spectrum allocation is linked to licensing, it's linked to the authorization, made also, also by the ministry. So, so it's something that I need, I, I think it needs to be reformed, actually. And um, uh, telecommunication services have been authorized and have been also blocked for, for, uh, for many ca companies that are not, not uh, with the regime. You know, that's something that has been happened in Greece and in, uh, in my country, and I think this is the way to see to to rethink about how spectrum allocation is going. And I think the key issue here is transparency. I need, we need to be, the regulatory have to be transparent about the spectrum allocation, 
okay, of course, we, 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 we understand, we all of us understand that there is spectrum for, for, for security reasons, for national security, for national defense, but transparency is the key issue. And I think with this, this could be, uh, have to be mandated by, uh, for, 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 for the regulatory agencies again. Thank you. Paul Tamarit, really quickly. So, I, and I actually agree with Kate, um, and I also agree with Claudio. I think that the challenge we are facing is not a technical challenge so much anymore. It is, a, it is a challenge of finding a way to change our collective understanding of business models. This is also part of the recommendation in the, in the PCAS report. One of the things that called out was that, that the uh, maintenance of, of auctions in, in their modeling and in their estimation was simply an unsustainable way to allocate spectrum. Um, financially, that that is the amount of money that comes in from the auction ba based on the cost that the auction, um, you know, the, the auction is, uh, they don't, they just don't balance out. But the reality is we have, we have billions of dollars of deployed infrastructure that's based on a particular business model that AT&T and Verizon and Orange and O2 are all, you know, responsible for, and shifting that to a new business model that's not based on, you know, property rights is a tough, is a tough go around. And, and that's one of the big challenges that we're facing. I, I know I said I want to go back to the floor, but I'm going to push you one step further. Um, <laughs> uh, so, so you know, you're talking about sort of, oh, sorry, I'm having this weird feedback. Um, uh, so, you know, you're talking about sort of the, the need for sort of regulatory frameworks that sort of think through new business models and uh, Tunisia is currently going through sort of a, a period of, of significant communications policy reform uh, and so there's sort of a, I think a unique moment here um, what would your recommendations be to to Moaz who admittedly is not like single-handedly controlling the spectrum environment Tunisia but but you know to, to his government uh, well I, I guess the first thing is basically start from a, uh, a, prin a principles perspective so the principle is either a, a sharing principle or a property rights principle. Um, we would advocate fundamentally to prioritize on the sharing principle first. What we recognize, if you've got deployed infrastructure, you just have to, that, that there's a, an evolutionary process that has to move it from one to the other. And just as analog television moved to digital television, it was a big challenge. That, you know, that, and, and, you know, 1G to 2G to 3G to 4G are all, you know, separate infrastructure challenges. I think you have to, you have to go through that. Um, but, you know, presume that you want to move towards sharing and start, start that way. And, and I think the re if you approach the regulatory framework design from that perspective, you, your, all of your hearings and processes will, will come out with a different, with a different result. Claudia, any recommendations from Moez and his government? <laughs> <laughs> are, do you, are your principles different than Paul's? <laughs> well, actually, I have to say I'm, I, I want to thank Paul because he agreed with me, but I know <laughs> <laughs> I have to say something different. No, because the recommendation I would give, and well, first of all, is that the, the Spectrum license should be, for us at least, uh, we believe exclusive. No overlays, no underlays, but also no sharing, because according to us, it gives less uh, certainty. And, um, and so also the license uh, should be flexible uh, in terms of also technological uh, neutrality and, and, and also, uh, you know, there should be a planning for uh, finance because also when, a, when someone is committed uh, to a finance, then there is also probably the maximized use of, uh, of spectrum. So these are some, uh, some of the... Uh, Comment about that. It's very interesting. I know that I have to hear your comments and your recommendation for my government, but at the same time, you <laughs> have to know. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's good. That's good to know, to hear about it. But just uh, you know that, okay, Tunisia have also um, been successful in uh, building digital, for example, digital TV infrastructure. But also the problem is not about just spectrum or infrastructure for digital TV, for example, but it's about content. And then we'd like to Kate also again, because I, I want to hear from her about how you can promote the content and the application on while also being uh, open for spectrum new new spectrum policies because it's very important issue when you have a, a good infrastructure and you don't have application and content so if, we, if you want to be successful and you want to see the result of your reform so I want to hear maybe from Kate about the media issue thank you um, I'll, I'll Man just threw you in the hot seat oh, no, I'll <laughs> take the invitation I, I mean are you asking for kind of you know some of the best practices in terms of how 
you deal with spectrum for for development and some of this does come from work that that you and and mo is and i had done together on a paper about spectrum in tunisia and i'm in no way you know pretending to be an expert on the tunisian situation but i think some of the lessons learned are are applicable and also come from a broader kind of media development movement i mean i have a few i have a few bullet points handy but but one of the things is about decentralizing broadcast ownership and creating different types of broadcast media outlets and that goes back again to the so called three tiered model where you have you know private broadcasting or private media you have public interest a public service media and you also have community media which is also noncommercial but it's different from public service that has a management structure that has a relationship to you know broader broader domestic principles and and frameworks and has a relationship to to government and perhaps public subsidies but so that third sector is 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 very important and i think it's quite exciting to see that you know at least on the agenda as a consideration is in tunisia is also about you know whether it's low power fm radio or some kind of noncommercial independent media that's that's really key and we we see this is as something that comes out of you know any kind of media media and development movement when you have governments that are truly interested again in enhancing public access or citizen access to the to the means of communication and i and i i have a couple other quick points but i think that you know to that end because sometimes especially at an internet governance forum mentioning something like low power fm radio licenses seems anachronistic but i really do think it's so critical that you know if we want the digital future to look um and be pluralistic and diverse we also have to look at where people are are today and even when we're talking about um about the about the the the, the internet and the technical um capacities we have to remember that you know people online are using the internet in very converged ways and a lot of the content that we're accessing we might be looking at um, with audio visual or print or what have you are still traditional news outlets that we might just be you know um experiencing in this different platform but the internet is both you know a space for existing media to have to have a have their space or and it as well as new platforms and new media projects being developed and i think it's also quite telling that you know in in tunisia the people that were um the most active in social media and were blogging and were key people in terms of you know um uh the the revolutionary movements one of the things that they're asking for um today is not just improve broadband access but they're asking for radio licenses because if you want to be able to communicate with people um you need to be where they're where they're at and it is and it is fm radio in these in these contexts um and when we think about the digital divide it's not just about who's got broadband access and who's who's got what um at their uh that they have access to whether it's in the in going to a, a library or a media center um or in the the home but people most people certainly in rural communities but even in in cities when you look at the price people are paying and the price points for mobile data delivery you know people aren't um listening to all the audio and video content all day long in a streaming context in many places and so again these other mediums um become really important i'll come back to some of the other points in a bit great let's uh throw this back out to the floor Hello. Hi, I'm Chris Rod, the U.S. Department of State, but speaking just in my personal capacity. Um, I want to ask a, a couple of different questions of the panel. I appreciate the discussion on allocation. I wanted to flag that first of all, but not, I'm not going to ask about that. I, I wanted to first say, do you think it's worth approaching rural and urban areas differently? Because the challenges and the opportunities are very different in them. Um, it's, I, I really appreciate the em emphasis on Wi-Fi offload and Pico cells in urban areas where congestion is a problem, but that's not the problem nor realistic solution when you're talking about rural areas where much more is needed for infrastructure investment. Um, and if that does seem like a, a smart way to do spectrum policy, how can we do that? Because that's really not something I have a lot of uh, insight into. Um, the second question is unrelated, and it's about standards. It's sort of the second half of this. There's spectrum policy, and then there's standards. And we have this great world now where GSM works the same all the way around the world, 
And personally, I'm worried that we're losing that with things like LTE vanity band classes. And I'm, I'm not sure if we will get back to, or even if we need to get back to, the international global harmonization wonders that we got from GSM. But I'm curious what the panelists' thoughts are. Okay, um, I, I'll just quickly t talk about, I mean, I think you're, you're talking mostly about the national level, the rural versus urban, because on the global level, I guess that would be a completely different conversation. Um, <coughs> and then it, it would obviously be dependent on the different context you're talking about. But th there is one, one thing that I, I wanted to flag, and because I, I'm not sure how many people uh, would be aware of it. There's something called the USF the Universal Service Fund, and this is a, a fund in, in every single country which comes from, uh, from the auction of licenses and, and, and uh, various other sources with the intention of, of being put in, reinvested back into infrastructure. In many countries, um, they haven't implemented, you know, 30% of that fund, either because they, they have sufficient infrastructure or they haven't just got the mechanisms to, to to really put that in place. And I think some innovative thinking around the USF, for instance, uh, focusing on, on a rural plan for, for rollout of infrastructure and broadband, for instance, because I do think it's absolutely critical that every person has the right to have access to, to communication infrastructure. But also the USF, as in other countries, such as in Turkey, for instance, that I'm aware of, are using it in many other interesting areas, like in mHealth and in, in e-education and things like this, to really ensure people have access. So I would, I would encourage people to look at the USF in their own countries and, and maybe talk to their governments about that. Um, in terms of, of standards, I mean, that is absolutely critical. It's so important that you can go to Vanuatu or Venezuela or whatever and be able to use mobile phone and, 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 uh, and stay connected. I, I know that there is a standard called uh, IMT Advanced, which is now uh, coming online from, from ITU, and that, uh, that has taken a number of years of, of, of deta detailed study and experimentation to ensure that there would be as much universal compatible uh, interoperability as possible. So LTE Advanced, for instance, is incorporated into that. Marketers are calling it 4G, but in fact it's, it's not exactly that. <laughs> but um, it's uh, IM, IMT Advanced, yeah, so that's, that's something that is, is, uh, it's an ITU standard uh, which we consider to be the next generation uh, from 3G. I will comment about the national thing that you mentioned, the rural and urban. As I mentioned before, it's very important for us to focus on those rural areas. We know that in Tunisia, for example, in urban areas, they really have quite accessible broadband, fiber, ADSL, LTG, all, all kind of uh, technology are, imp are implemented by the operator. It is a competitive uh, play, uh, um, competitive region to for, for, for them. But at the same time, in rural areas, Okay, we, we have a total coverage of voice, for example, in Tunisia. We have 100% of the population covered by voice, uh, so by telephony, I mean. So we have access to GSM everywhere in the country. But when we, when we think about, uh, when we, we look at uh, broadband, we don't find really accessible. A lo lot of regions don't have 3G, and a lot of places, uh, cities need to be enforced in terms of uh, infrastructure. So this is how, why actually the government is uh, focusing on building a, a broadband plan and we have uh, a good opportunity to work with uh, USAID in this field also because they're promoting a, a, a broadband plan to do in some regions and including the Universal Service Fund because we have a fund for years but it's used for other things, not for, 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 for yeah, yeah, we <laughs> have to be transparent in this, in this field. Yeah, it was used for, for censorship, for example. It was used to, 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 to subsidize censorship equipment, surveillance equipment for ITI. So we need to be transparent for that. And uh, other, other issues is that we need to develop this broadband plan. And uh, I think if you look to the license, for example, given recently to Oxford, recently to Tunisiana in, in 3G, and you see in terms of obligations, you will find that in two years you need to, to, to cover 60% of the population, is very, very, and including rural areas. It is mentioned for the first time in our license. I think it's a little uh, complicated for them, but uh, uh, that shows the will of the government to cover those regions. So that could be answered to your question. Thank you. So a um, couple things on the standards. They're critically important. Um, it's one of the things that... Uh, that ITU is very helpful in, uh, in in this space, and yet at the same time, the standards are 
are changing. And you have to think about this as a collection of ecosystems. We have the broadcasting ecosystem, by, by which is divided into the FM radio ecosystem and the you know, digital television ecosystem, et cetera. Uh, and you have a voice communications ecosystem, and they all operate on different, have different sets of technical standards. One of the things that's happening, and it, it is an evolution over mm -hmm. many, many mm -hmm. years, it's not going to happen o directly overnight, but we are all moving to a world where what's being delivered is just IP packets in a very, very standard way. And the, the applications that deliver you the ability to speak uh, end up being applications that that put IP packets out onto those networks. That's a fundamental transformation of all of the wireless and wired networks that, as I said, will take place over years. And that means that the, the standards, where the standards are, will move further upstream actually more into the devices themselves and have more of the smarts in the device. Lots of routing smarts in the network, but, but the devices themselves will the, the place they need to be standardized is in their ability to talk to the network. That's a big change, um, but over a long period of time. In the meantime, we actually do have to figure out how to make sure that Wi-Fi stays compatible with Wi-Fi, and LTE actually means something consistent as you travel around the world or, or, or we, have a, we have a problem. Uh, as far as the rural um, and urban, I think we already do some things. The, the business community essentially treats rural and urban differently already. And so we have in the U.S., for example, the WISP, uh, the WISP you know, providers that because the business model doesn't work for a, a, a big sort of carrier infrastructure in a very low population density, you see an alternative solution. I think we could do more. Um, and you could think about, you know, defining kind of metrics that could help you define the the, the regions in which uh, you might ap apply a different model. So a megahertz pop is something that is sort of typically an ex people use to compare economics around spectrum allocation. In you might do megahertz pop plus you know uh, a an area as a as some kind of a metric that you could you could use. But I think ultimately you're still uh, you still want to find a way to drive towards the evolution of these ecosystems in a way that that advantages as much as possible sharing, but that there's this sort of phase in over this, over a period of time that catches the ecosystems up. Because it's not fair on the existing ecosystem providers to just sort of change the, change the game out from under them. That doesn't make sense. At the same time, you know, e everyone will need to evolve just as the television broadcasters in the U.S. had to evolve sort of unwillingly originally to digital TV and, you know, now it's turned out to be not such a bad thing. Claudia. No, I wanted to agree with Paul in the fact that certainly the business <laughs> <laughs> we are having, <laughs> so that the business can do, uh, can do more. Um, but at the same time, one point I wanted to highlight is that, for example, in the broadband plan, uh, something that could be useful is, for example, also to connect school, governments, and a hospital, because that's certainly uh, also uh, allow the take up and people to be more and more, uh, you, you know, to, to, uh, to be more and more connected. And also, I wanted also to stress that for a standard point of view, it's certainly important uh, for consumers that are, um, that can travel easily around the world using uh, different devices. So it's certainly something that we have to consider. Okay, R really quick. Uh, really quickly, I think that, um, the redistribution of a, por of, the, of a portion of the digital dividend for rural development and for community use is something that can be really important, especially where there's greater needs for Wi-Fi for the last mile and so forth. I think the exemption from license fees for non-commercial spectrum usage is really key and very significant to your, to your question because you know, the non-commercial media and the community-based media tend to be the greater servers so tend to service rural communities more than, than some of the larger commercial media, which is so it, if you want to make a commitment to um, uh, rural media, that's one way to do it. And then also, you know, there's a ways to, to generate revenue that can be redistributed for non-commercial usage. And there's countries from France and Denmark to Colombia that do that. And I know that that's not something that, you know, either the largest spectrum holders or incumbent broadcasters are happy with. But whether it's a, a, a tax on the license fee that commercial broadcasters or commercial spectrum users pay or other kinds of redistribution, that's certainly a way to support this, support um, rural media and, and non-commercial usage. 
some really interesting uh, ideas there. Uh, and I'm glad that Chris got such a comprehensive answer to his questions. Are there other folks on the floor who have a question? Can we pass the mic down? Hello? Yeah? Okay. Thank you. Mawaki Chongo, APC. Um, I, I've come here really to learn uh, about uh, spectrum management, and I, I've been picking up uh, pieces and bits from your intervention, and I would like to know if uh, someone can really summarize how all of this work from uh, ITU function of uh, coordination, allocation and coordination at global level. Um, is it like a, a partitioning of some kind of space between country, and uh, are those national uh, spaces like a sovereign space where once a country gets a chunk or whatever it is, um, there's no interference between countries and they have uh, the right to manage it as as they will, and and. Uh, Regarding the topic of this uh, panel, uh, I would like you to um, to give us some ideas about uh, how the newer and smarter way of allocating and managing the spectrum enables some specific development applications. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'll try and I'll try and answer the question as best I can. Um, but first of all, I think I'd like to put the emphasis on uh, the, the overall global objective, which is really the sort of rational, equitable, efficient allocation of, of spectrum. Um, and it's very much about interoperability and harmonization. So we're not talking about partitioning. It's quite the opposite, I would say, in many ways. And, okay, well, we're talking a lot here about mobile communication. I mean... So to illustrate it maybe a bit better would be uh, aviation, for instance, aviation communication, which of course is fundamental to the safety of, of air traffic. Um, we have the same for maritime uh, transport. We have the same with oceanographic radar. Uh, many, many different uses of spectrum, uh, space research, uh, climate uh, observation, earth observation, lots and lots of different uh, um, services which are critical, not all of them linked to, to profit and industry, um, but li linked to really increasing our knowledge uh, on a global level on, on really key issues. Um, so, so that's very important. So there is a very strong developmental uh, aspect there. H how it actually happens, um, well, there's a, there's a whole ecosystem, there's a trendy word here mm -hmm. this morning, there's a whole ecosystem of, of committees and working groups and study groups and focus groups uh, which are all connected, they all basically come back to the mothership of the World Radio Communi Conference, Communication Conference, which happens every three years or so. It can happen uh, at a shorter notice if there's something particularly urgent uh, to be dealt with, for instance. The last um, one, which was just this year, um, has r is recognized really as setting the, the, st the ground for the rollout of mobile broadband. And everybody in government and industry and many different sectors uh, d different stakeholders were very, very uh, satisfied with the outcome of that, and that will all be, there's a lot of work to be done now, but that will all be formalized in 2015. So again, it's it, ITU is an intergovernmental organization. However, we're quite different to many other intergovernmental organizations, particularly UN ones, where we also have private sector members. So the private sector members are very important in providing knowledge and, and, and inputs to all of the research and, and so that we can keep our finger on the pulse. But ultimately, it's the governments who are who are signing treaties in, in our current global system. Um, so th 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 it is a treaty-making conference, so it's binding, um, and that is that's why we we have such pretty good interoperability from satellites to mobile phones to all all of the many many multivariate uses of radio frequencies today. I hope that somehow helps. Paul, am I right? Do you want to jump in on Milwaukee's question about development applications and? Well, there's, to some extent, the answer is limited only by your imagination, um, and, and that's really been the, the case all along. If we go back 50 years, nobody, in fact, 
how many, you, everybody in this room probably has seen Star Trek, right? That seen or heard of Star Trek? So Star Trek was a very futuristic show in 1962. Um, they could transport themselves from, you know, and up in space, directly down to a planet, dematerialize, etc. And with all of the wacky imaginary stuff that they put together in that show, they never came up with the idea of a smartphone, right? <laughs> they had a tricorder <laughs> and a walkie-talkie, <laughs> right? That's what they had. So, so, so here we are. I, you know, I would be kind of an idiot if I tried to forecast all of the things that we can do. But just a few things that people are already thinking about that you could do with Spectrum if we had, if we were able to, to utilize it differently. Um, we could do better management of our parking lots and traffic. I already mentioned the auto train. Um, we could do a lot more with medical telemetry and, and de you know, implanted devices that keep you alive in a, in a nice way. Um, people who have pacemakers today, for example, the, the newest pacemakers, you know, you can go in and you can get yourself tuned up. <coughs> they sort of, but you need to go in and see the doctor and hook yourself up to some machines and they can kind of tune the pacemaker. But with, you know, spectrum allocated in a different way, some of that could be just done remotely as you're living. Lots of issues with what I just suggested, but you could do that. Uh, BMW has got a self-driving, you know, five series car floating around to the highways in Germany. That's pretty cool. That's one example of a car that can do all kinds of things because of Spectrum. Google has another one, and I think it's driving around Nevada in the U.S. Again, more policy issues there. Um, I, I presided over a trial of white spaces technology in Cambridge, U.K. last year that ran for about 10 months. The, it's still basically running, but the trial is officially over. Uh, one of the applications there was uh, controlling when the trash cans were picked up by the by the service vehicles. Instead of coming along once a week, which they used to do, they don't come along until the trash can signals that it's ready to be emptied. Um, you know, standard ideas like you know uh, running or that the water meter and the you know electric meter, so the billing you know meter readers don't have to go around. That's one. But think about it in a developing country that has to do irrigation control. What if you could do irrigation control on crops, you know, using using radio spectrum? Um, it's technically possible, but not not currently um, something that's generally feasible because of the the, the way that spectrum is regulated. Uh, and and those are just you know a few examples. Many more, I'm sure, people brighter than I will come up with later. Thank you. Now, uh, I'm Silvia Cadena. I'm working with APNIC in Australia, but in a previous life, I was um, working in Latin America, um, coordinating a project called Tricalcar that provided a roadshow of wireless trainings all around the region and uh, supported around 200 technicians in different countries in the in the region to deploy their wireless networks. And uh, the team that I was uh, very proud to be a member of did some research and did, uh, they, uh, maybe you have heard of them, they broke the world record on the longest distance uh, wi uh, wireless uh, link uh, in for 380 kilometers a few years back. And uh, they did it in a mountain in Venezuela and uh, once all the testing was done, there was a lot of uh, controversy from the government with the way they did it, and it was for research purposes, but it from <laughs> you know. And so I was wondering if uh, there is any um, strategy planned by the ITU and uh, the big folks out there to help the people on the field that are actually making these thi things work to, to actually uh, be supported by somebody else from the outside saying, look, you have implemented these regulations, you are doing it really well, but you have to also to allow some room for innovation at a different level. Um, and I think uh, 
that are uh, coming from what I come from is uh, sometimes it's really m easier if someone from the outside say point the finger and say you should be doing this or you should be doing that than when they have to do it by themselves and uh, pressure from the outside always keeps uh, taps on extra additional controls and regulations that might not be useful for anyone. So. Oh, you want to respond? Yeah, I just I just like to ask back a little bit. Uh, um, wh why I didn't understand exactly why the government was uh, so critical. I mean, I thought that would have been something they would have been quite proud of and uh, a leadership opportunity. Yes, that's what we thought. <laughs> but sometimes that's uh, the, the reason I'm asking is and and there is a lot of uh, wireless projects, community wireless projects in different parts of the world doing very innovative things, and they are considered not you know not legal or outside of 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 the plans of the government maybe because they expect that this the government that has to do the innovation i don't i don't really really literally we don't get it we 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 were then we just did all the press releases and we did all the things thinking oh my god they're going to be super happy and then they got in trouble <laughs> so it's it's not uh it's not something uh, easy to explain exactly why is what is going on, but yeah, I think uh, the work that, the, for example, the ICTP Institute in Fiesta is doing on research that is linked to the uh, Esla Red Foundation in Venezuela and all the other uh, people that participated in the Trikalkar project and the Wilak project and Mahavir here in the Nepal Wireless project in in the mountains and so many crowd, so many people doing awesome things on wireless. But they are all facing issues of accessing a frequency for research purposes or for development purposes, and they can't get them through. They get a, a lot of um, a stick from the government, and it would be great if there would be an opportunity. I mean, there, I think there is an opportunity there for ITU to do something to support, and others to support what innovators are doing on the. Paul, what do you think? Very quickly, I mean, um, ITU as a, as a secretariat, let's say, where I work, I mean, we're very interested in all sorts of innovation that come uh, from all corners of the world. So it's not something that's, that's uh, discouraged, let's say, and it's something we try to showcase quite a lot. We had ITU Telecom World recently in Dubai, where there's a fantastic track with young innovators um, doing all sorts of amazing things. And uh, so it's something we really want to promote, particularly from young people. Um, in, in this one, is, uh, it must be a country-specific issue, but I mean, ev even in, in the Americas, we had recently the Connect Americas uh, Summit, which was in uh, Panama, and again, a major focus on innovation and on investment. Um, I know from the technical point of view, there was spectrum uh, allocated for scientific research. I don't know if it would fall under that. Um, and you'd need to get some you know, expertise on, on that to, to, to advise you. Um, Otherwise, I, you know, I would say keep up the good work, and uh, it, it sounds it sounds excellent what, what's happening. Great. Uh, I want to give our, our panelists time for a br very brief tweet long closing remarks. But uh, is there a final question from the floor from anyone? Last question, anyone? All right. Oh. All right, Milwaukee, quickly. Yes, uh, it's not really a question, but uh, just a quick request. Uh, I would like, to, after the uh, the panel, I will approach uh, each one of you, if you can uh, give me some reading list to uh, research this a little further and understand a little further uh, uh, what all, uh, all this is all about. Thank you. Sure. Um, so let's uh, let's move. We've only have about ten minutes left, so let's let's move to closing statements and remarks. Um, Claudia, do you want to kick us off? Well, I think I have addressed already uh, my, my request of releasing more and more spectrum, so I, I will escape that. But what I wanted to say is that we are really in the early state of the mobile internet revolution, and we really need to work all together to the ecosystem to allow that to continue and to give, um, to allow customers really to benefit of that. So, I, and I will close, I will stop here. You know, I can't disagree with anything she just said. <laughs> well, <that's wonderful. laughs> no. I, I completely agree. We are we are you know at an inflection point. I think um, 
we need to be very thoughtful about how we move this inflection point forward and part of being thoughtful makes sure is means making sure we're not foreclosing any opportunities through our you know regulatory regimes but that we're creating the proper balance between you know preserving what we have and moving forward into the future and i just urge that the policy makers you know spend a lot of time doing doing diligence and in an open and transparent way and and we'll get the best results I think that the key issue today is to learn that spectrum is not a technical issue for government. It's also a technical issue for all stakeholders. So civil society have to be involved on those issues by transfer by by letting the go by I mean the government have to be transparent on those issues. Uh, so uh, I think that also um, the convergence is could be important as we heard from you today. I think that we have we, we, we media broadcasting IT. Uh, telecommunication from the ITU pr perspective, I think this convergence would be uh, an important challenge for regulators in order to uh, apply, to, to implement right policy for the future. Okay. Um, I said in the beginning when I arrived that, you know, I, I was also here to, to, to learn and listen a little bit. Um, I know a lot of these issues have been discussed uh, in different forums, and I think one important point was, has been made, or one takeaway that I uh, that I bring with me from this discussion, is that spectrum is not just about technical issues. There's a lot of uh, a, a lot of social and, and a lot of um, rethinking that might need to be done. A lot of social uh, impact. There's also a lot of rethinking that needs to be done in terms of business models. Um, I think at ITU, it's 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 basically the, the only forum that brings the world government and, and industry together around various issues linked to information and communication technologies. And I think this is a, it's a forum that we can, we can provide increasingly to discuss these issues, um, but also to, you know, with an objective of, of, uh, of influencing the way uh, how Spectrum is, is managed in the more in innovative ways uh, and, and, and having channels to listen more to, uh, to the different concerns. So that's something I think uh, that I'd certainly take away from this. And I, I know the, the Global Symposium for Regulators, for instance, could be a very good place for that. The next one is in Poland next year, so not very far from you, Kate. Um, and then finally, uh, just to come back to Paul's opening statement, uh, when we talked about whether it was finite or infinite, um, uh, I guess that's a, a matter of perspective, but he should contribute to the Wikipedia um, <laughs> The, the Wikipedia <laughs> definition, because the, every definition I looked at said it was finite. But so I think his argument sounded very good to me. So uh, he should he should certainly put a contribution in there. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry. Oh, well, uh, thank you. And, and if I, I if I may, I, I you know it's encouraging to hear you talk about the the, the role of the ITU and in, in looking beyond some of the technical um, questions. And I, and I hope that that does translate into a again, a more holistic way of, of thinking about um, spectrum. And this just my three very short concluding points. I mean, trickle-down media democracy doesn't work. Um, spectrum planning must include this equ equitable uh, distribution that recognizes the different kinds of users um, from the smaller private industry and private businesses, and uh, as well to, again, the, the non-commercial usage and the community-based uses. And I think that, um, you know, to the point about it, this question being more than just technical considerations and the, the social and economic factors being so key, if, if, I, if I may end with a quote from Howard Rheingold, that if we decided communities came first, how would we use our tools differently? And I think we can also apply that and say, how do we design tools differently if communities came first? And how would we manage spectrum if these social factors were really paramount and the main, um, the main goal was to expand the number of uh, voices and, and players in the market? Interesting note to end on. Uh, thanks uh, very much to our panelists and to our audience members, and uh, enjoy your last day of IGF. If